Grab your Bible and uh, go with me to Luke's Gospel, chapter 24. While you're turning there, I got a dear friend of mine that is here. Um, he just wildly stepped in and took over for us at Hope Unlimited when we moved back. Pastor Cole Burks is in the house. He's in Hamilton last minute because pastoring is awesome, and sometimes you got to get away. Um, Luke's Gospel, chapter 24. I found out last night that I was going to be preaching, and Miss Karen called, and uh, when she called Lindsay, and she was on speakerphone, and the only direction she gave me was, she said, preach something hopeful. And I think what she meant was, is the last couple of times you preached, we felt hopeless. <laughs> so whatever you've been doing, do something different. And so hopefully this will be hope-filled. Hopefully. My hope is that you have hope. Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, um, very familiar passage, very familiar story. I want to read it to you. Verse number uh, 13. Also, I want to remind you, as Pastor Jacob was reminding you about this week, I want, you to, I want to remind you as well to be in prayer for the victims of the hurricane. Um, we have a number of friends there, people who have lost everything. I mean, this was absolutely devastating. Um, so please, please, please uh, be in prayer for them as well. Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, verse number 13. Now, on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus. Everybody say Emmaus. <clears throat> they were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And the things that had happened was Jesus has just been crucified, um, and now they can't find his body. They don't know that he is resurrected, even though he told them about a thousand times. They're like, where's Jesus? <laughs> Even though he told them the grave's not going to be able to hold me, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll build it up, um, it, it still doesn't dawn on them where he's at. So they're walking back home to Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and he went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Another translation says their eyes were restrained so that they could not see him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? And they stood still, looking sad. You gotta, they're not throwing throw my translation up there. I got a funny, weird, new translation. I apologize for that. <laughs> then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? <laughs> Who does not know what rock have you been living under? That you're the only person that doesn't know what has happened? Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there these last couple of days? And Jesus says, what things? <laughs> Tell me more. They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. Watch verse 21. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, to make matters worse, there were some women of our group that astounded us. They went to the tomb early this morning, and when they didn't find his body, they came back and they told us that they had seen a vision of angels. So now people are hallucinating. And the angel said, he's alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb, and they found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going to go on. He wasn't really going anywhere. He was pretending like he was going to keep walking. 
he walked ahead as if he were going to go on. And they urged him strongly, saying, stay with us, because it's almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with him. Well, look at that. Verse 30, when he was at the table with them, he took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to them. He took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And then he vanished from their sight. And then they said to each other, you should read the Bible this way. It is is a comedy from start to finish. (laughs) They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road? And while he was opening the scriptures to us? And at the middle of the night, they jump up and they run seven miles back to Jerusalem after they just got home. And they found the 11 and their companions gathered together. And they were saying, the Lord is risen indeed and he's appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road. And how, watch this, how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. He was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Amen. Amen. There was a great, uh, he was a Jesuit priest, French Jesuit priest that wrote a poem years ago. And this was the first line of his poem. He said this, he said, but above all, trust In the slow work of God. But above all, trust in the slow work of God. If you've not figured it out by now, when God deals with us, he takes his sweet time. Yes. Every morning when I get on the internet, when I pull up social media, And I thumb through, I'm seeing all of these, I think the popular term is influencers. And all these influencers are yelling at me. Get up at 4 a.m. and go work out and eat meat and no carbohydrates and take a cold bath for some reason. I don't know. And then like get a planner and have goals and change the world and stand on top of your mountain. And then if you don't, your life just sucks and it's terrible and it's miserable. And be efficient and just get after it and hustle and grind and all the, the language. And you just get punched in the face with that in the morning. Right? Be efficient, be efficient, be efficient. Structure your morning, structure your evening, structure the... I'm like, I, 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 can't, I, I don't know if it's my personality, whatever my Enneagram is. <laughs> if you don't know what the Enneagram is, it's a numerical system that we use to explain away all of our bad characteristics. <laughs> You're a jerk. Ah, I'm a five. Can't help it. <laughs> right? <laughs> Hyper-emotional, just a four. Got to live with that. Shut up. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) My daughters, there's changes. They're like, I'm a one today, and I was a seven last night, then I'm a four and a half. (laughs) With a wing. I don't know what a wing is. Wing something or another. (laughs) Right? There's this push to be productive and this push to be efficient. And then when I think about the work of God in my life and the way I've seen God work in all of our lives, God is not interested in efficiency at all. God is massively not efficient. If God wanted to be efficient, he should not have created humans the way he created them. It takes best case scenario It takes you 18 years to get a kid out of your house. It takes dogs six weeks. They're way more efficient. God did not call us to be productive like a machine. He called us to be fruitful like a tree. But above all, trust in the slow work of God. There's a great book you should, you should check out sometime. It's called Three Mile an Hour God. Three Mile an Hour God. Because humans walk at three miles an hour. 
And when Adam falls in the garden, you see God walking toward him in the cool of the day. When Jesus is in his ministry and doing his work, you see Jesus walking from city to city and Jesus walking from place to place. The thought that God moves at three miles an hour. Sometimes you have to slow down to catch up with God. Sometimes you got to slow down to catch up with God. But above all, trust in the slow work of God. Now, this is challenging for us, especially Pentecostals, because we love reading those miracle stories where it's like Jesus touched him and immediately everything was changed. Boom, done, healed. We love those. That's why I love Mark. First reason I love Mark is because it's the shortest one. (laughs) He's like, Jesus healed him. Boom. Done. Moving on. Pray for the sick. Turn the city upside down. And not all the gospel writers do that. Some of the gospels say Jesus prayed for a man, and it was at that hour that he began to get well. There's a great great church father named Maximus. He said, we want Jesus, we want Christ to come to us in his full stature, but we don't want Christ to come to us as an infant. That comes to us in infancy, in the beginning stages, and then and only then does his work begin to happen in our life. We want encounter, not process. And then we explain away things like, why does God heal some people immediately in the Bible and then other people it takes time? It is a work that happens over time. It's not because there are levels to God's power that's at work. It's because it takes us different, it takes us different times and different speeds to catch up with what God is doing in us. And most of the time that God's doing in us, he's doing something that we don't even realize we need. He's not always doing what we want. God is always at work. He is always at work. And sometimes he is working in ways that we want. God is always at work. And sometimes he's working in ways that we can see. He's always at work. And then other times he is disappointing us time after time after time after time. Read the New Testament. Read the Gospels. The disciples always think they know what's happening. And Jesus comes along and says, what are you talking about? I mean, he does this all the time. There's a guy that comes to him and says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, why are you calling me good? He's like, thought you were good. Disappointing them time after time after time. There are, there's a story where they bring a lame man to Jesus. There's so many people crowded in front of the house that they can't even get the poor lame man into the house. I want you to think of this picture for a moment. You are listening to Jesus. There is a man that cannot walk being dragged by four people, and you don't have the wherewithal to move out of the door. Right? And so what they do instead is they climb up on top of a roof. They start ripping a hole in a stranger's house. They lower the man down through the building because he is lame. He's been lame from his, from his youth, and he cannot walk. And as soon as they lower him down in front, of the, in front of Jesus, they think this is the big moment, and everybody's watching, and Jesus doesn't heal him. He says, your sins are forgiven. They're like, that's not what we did all this for. <laughs> is it not obvious what we need? And Jesus is saying, no, it is not obvious what you need. Because what you think you need is not always what you need. And what you want is for sure not always what you need. Here's a famous saying. I'm going to quote that great prophet, Kevin Barnett. That sometimes the worst thing God can do for you is give you your way. As a matter of fact, in the book of Romans, when God gets ready to judge people, the Bible says he gives them over to themselves. He doesn't give them over to Satan. He doesn't give them over to the demons. He doesn't give them over to the Arkansas Razorbacks. Roll tight. You knew it was coming. You knew it was coming. It's okay, Brian. Jesus loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. (laughs) 
But when he gets ready to judge them, he gives them over to themselves. They, they cannot get through the door. They rip a hole in the roof and they lower the man down and they're believing for healing and Jesus does none of that. One disappointment after another. This is exactly the situation that we find ourselves in when we find these disciples walking back home to a mess. They've been following Jesus for three and a half years. Laid down everything. Jesus did not even tell them where we're going. When Jesus says, follow me, he doesn't say anything about martyrdom. He doesn't say anything about being pulled apart with horses or crucified upside down or beheaded. He doesn't say anything about all of Rome is going to be chasing you and you're going to hide for your life. It would have been nice to have known that ahead of time. <laughs> because when God speaks to you, you got you to gotta think about what he didn't say. Yeah. That's how you know God's a man. Because when God talks to you, he gives you about as much information as a man does when a man talks to you. <laughs> I go on the road and preach somewhere. I call my wife. Her first question, how was service? My response, fine. <laughs> Conversation over. My wife goes to preach somewhere. I call her, how was service? We start with what the process of getting ready was like. <laughs> you got to pay attention to what he doesn't say. So this is where we're at. We're thrown in the midst of a disappointment. And these disciples have left Jerusalem, and they're walking back home to a mess. Brokenhearted, confused, disoriented, feeling like idiots because we put all of our eggs in this one basket. We backed the wrong horse. We thought this guy was the guy. Come, come to find out he was not the guy. He died like everybody else that came along and said they were the guy. They go from this is it to this ain't it. I like that better. This is it to what the heck. That's what she said. <laughs> this is it. This ain't it. You ever been disappointed like that? This is it. This ain't it. You ever had somebody in your life that you were believing God to move in their life and then they start showing signs of coming back home to God and coming back home and you think this is it? Wake up the next morning, they went off the deep end. I preached at a rehab one time. I, sh I probably shouldn't tell this story. I'll just never forget it. <laughs> you know, Spencer, you know the one I'm talking about. Yes, you do. I went and preached at a rehab one time, and I was preaching, and I did my whole bit, and I don't remember what I preached on. I'm sure it was horrific. And um, after it was over, there was this, this man there that, I mean, just say he lived a rough life. <laughs> you got to stop laughing. <laughs> to say he lived a rough life, it's an understatement. And he came to me, and he had, a, he had his hand behind his back. Now, he's fresh out of prison. And I'm thinking, all right. Where's the director? The only other person there to help me was Eric Cruz, my best friend who wouldn't spit on you if you were on fire much less defend you from a, well, he had his hand back, and he was crying, he was weeping. I didn't know if he was mad, sad, glad, happy. I didn't know. He was weeping and he was shaking. And, he, and, he, and then he started talking and I was like, oh, thank God. He said, that sermon changed my life. I said, glory to God. He said, you know what I got behind my back? I said, I don't. <laughs> and he jerked around. And it was a copy of The Passion of the Christ, the movie. And he goes, I watch this every day. And I was like, wait a second. I don't think that's healthy. I don't think you should be doing that. I know that sounds crazy, but I don't think you should be. Like, I've seen that movie once, and I never want to see it again. They watched it on the Chosen bus one time, and I was laying in my seat. Shit, it, 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 yep, glory. No. He said, I watch this every day, and I was like, glory to God. He's like, you changed my life. And he starts telling me he's crying, he's weeping. I'm like, oh, this is glorious. This is it. I go back the next week, and I preach, and he's not there. 
And I asked the director, I said, hey, where's so-and-so? And, 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 and as cool as cool could be, he goes, oh, he's back in jail. He stole a van. <laughs> this is it. This ain't it. <laughs> but the director, well, I was shocked. It was the, the, the director had been so jaded and disillusioned and desensitized. He's like, oh, bad guy. No words. Won't be seeing him again. I was like, what? <laughs> you, you ever booked a hotel online? And you look at the picture and you read the reviews and you think, hmm, this is it. And then you pull up to the address and you're like, what meth house am I staying at? And you're looking at your phone and you're looking at what's in front of you. This ain't it. You ever been, <laughs> you ever been disappointed? Some of y'all, some of y'all dated some people in high school and you thought this was it. <laughs> some of y'all RSM students right now looking across that first year classroom talking about, look at God. I know why he brought me here. This is it. This ain't it. Hamilton got a new Italian restaurant. This is it. At the same time, Denali's closed down. This ain't it. Krista said it best. He gives and he takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I don't know what all that has to do with a mess, but... They're walking back home with their hearts devastated. We left everything. We gave up our businesses. We left our families. We were ridiculed. We were mocked. And we believed him. We thought this was it. And now he is dead. And not only is he dead, we can't even find his body to go mourn him every year. We are going back home to pick up the pieces of our life and see if we can sort this back out. They're walking seven miles from Jerusalem. Jerusalem's hilly place. Walking back home. And as they're walking back home, you imagine, imagine two offended people on a seven-mile walk after their church leader just hurt him. Yeah. He said he was going to do this, and he said he's going to do that. They're talking back and forth. You think they're encouraging each other? Don't you know people better than that by now? <laughs> they're walking home. Jesus, you got you to love Jesus through this whole story. He walks up and says, so, what y'all talking about? And Cleopas is like, it's too early for that. Too soon. What, what, what are y'all talking about? What had happened? And they said, where have you been? Where have you been? Do you not know? The Bible says their eyes were held so that they could not see him. They could not see him, not because he was hiding. They couldn't see him because they were hurting. Because it is hard to see God rightly when you're hurting. Pain has a way of blurring your vision. That's why you can't make deci decisions out of pain. That's why when Pastor Jacob gets up and rebukes you at RSM, you can't say, I've had enough of this place. It's the same thing that happens when Jesus walks across the water in the middle of the storm. And as soon as they see Jesus, they don't say, look, it's Jesus. They say, look, it's a spirit. Because pain, being in a storm, has a way of blurring your vision. This is exactly what happens to John the Baptist. As soon as we meet John the Baptist, we find this bold, fiery prophet that we all want to identify with for some reason. John the Baptist. He got his head cut off. Ooh. 
We want to identify with John the Baptist because he stands on the river Jordan. He says, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. All of you better repent, you bunch of vipers. And we're like, yes. And then the next time we find John, he is in prison. And do you know what John is saying now? John is not saying, behold, the Lamb of God. He is saying to his disciples, go ask him, are you the one? Or do we need to go find another? What happened to that conviction, John? What happened to that boldness, John? Because it's easy to be bold when that conviction's never been tested. It's easy to believe for something when that belief has never been tested. It's easy to say, I'll stand with fallen brothers and sisters until your brother or sister falls and you actually have to do it. It's easy to say we're a church that welcomes everybody and anybody until anybody starts showing up. Because it's hard to see God when you're hurting. They're walking back home and they can't see him. And you have to ask questions like, can you, did you not, did his voice not ring a bell? Even Mary knew when he called her by by her name. Did his voice not ring a bell? Did it not sound familiar to you? If his voice didn't sound familiar to you, what about the way he carried himself? You knew Jesus carried himself differently. They always talked about it. This man teaches as one with authority and not as the scribes. They always talked about how he carried himself. Could you not detect how he... Yeah, glory to God. It happens. That's how fire this sermon is right now. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. My daughter always says, nobody says fire anymore, Dad. And I'm like, don't make me spit bars. Y'all don't know what that means, do you? Don't make me spit bars. Jacob, you know about spitting bars. And then they just roll their eyes in sheer disgust. Just like, oh, God. I always thought it was weird when old people didn't understand the language. Till I became an old person that didn't understand the language. <laughs> Purr queen. <laughs> They're walking. Listen, <laughs> come back to me. They're walking to Emmaus. Could you not see it was Jesus by his face? This didn't ring a bell. Thomas said you could look at his hands and see the scars. None of this registered. And so finally, Jesus starts preaching. Jesus says, okay. I'm going to start at Moses. I'm going to start at the very beginning. We've got seven miles. I'm going to go real slow for you. And I'm going to preach what I always preached. Myself. And it's not like Jesus is a poor communicator. You get to listen to the greatest preacher that ever lived. For seven miles. And then they still don't see him. And then finally they get to Emmaus. And the Bible says that he made as though he would go along. But they said, no, 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 no. We want you to stay. Because there's something about the hospitality to strangers that opens you up for God to work in your life. We don't know who you are, but don't leave. And the Bible says they sit down to eat. And he takes the bread. Then he blesses the bread then he breaks the bread then he gives it he takes it he blesses it he breaks it he gives it and boom their eyes are open and you have to ask the question what happened at that table that seven and a half miles of preaching couldn't accomplish 
what happened at that table? That walking and talking with Jesus as he unpacks Moses and all of the prophets pointing to himself. What happened at that table that seven miles of him exegeting the Old Testament declaring the glory of his own goodness. What happened at that table that kind of preaching couldn't accomplish. The Bible says that he took the bread and that he blessed the bread and then he broke the bread and then he gave the bread. And then Luke ends by saying they knew him and how he broke the bread. This is what we call communion. They knew him and how he broke the bread. If your mind runs through all of the stories of Jesus sitting down at the table, there's a time when Jesus takes a little boy's lunch to feed 5,000 people. The Bible says that he takes the bread, then he blesses the bread, then he breaks it, and then he gives it. The night before he is crucified, he sits down at what we call the Last Supper. And you know what the Bible says? The Bible says he took the bread, and then he blesses the bread, and then he breaks the bread, and then he gives the bread. And when he's with his disciples, they, he does the same process that he always does he takes it he blesses it he breaks it and then he gives it and their eyes are open because whenever God gets ready to do a work in your life he's going to do the same thing for you he's going to take you and then he's going to bless you and then he's going to break you so that he can give you he never violates his own order he takes you he blesses you he breaks you and then he gives you He took these disciples early in the Gospels. He blessed them as they walked with him. And now his crucifixion broke them. But he's only breaking them so that he can turn around. And in a book called the Acts of the Apostles, he can give them for the life of the world. He never violates his own order. You see this happening in David's life. He takes David out of the house of Jesse. And then he blesses him with the anointing on his life. And then he breaks him in the house of Saul so that David could then be given for the nation. This is all through your Bible. He takes you. He blesses you. He breaks you. And he gives you. You see this happening with Joseph. He takes Joseph out from among his brothers and then he blesses him by putting a coat of many colors on him. And his brothers rip the coat off of him because they think if we can strip the coat off of Joseph, we can strip the favor off of Joseph. What they did not understand is that the coat did not make the man. The man made the coat. Yeah, I need somebody to help me. Arson, where you And then he breaks him in the dungeon and he breaks Joseph in Potiphar's house. But the Bible says even while he was in the dungeon, he was interpreting dreams. And then God gives him. He never violates his own order. I I remember being a teenager when God was taking me. When God was taking me. Everybody has those seasons where God is highlighting you. Every service you go into, you're getting a prophetic word. Even at churches that don't believe in prophetic words. They like stumble over. They're like, I don't know what this means and this feels weird, but I feel like I'm supposed to tell you something. (laughs) You know what I'm talking about? It's like they're taking you. I remember when I was a teenage boy, felt called to preach in every church I went into. And I was a Baptist boy. Every church I go into, they'd be like, you, 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 you ruggedly handsome young man standing back there. I was like, me? Talking to me? They say, stand up. Stand up. They say, God's given you the mantle of John Knox. I just weep, thinking, who's John Knox? (laughs) (laughs) Who is that? (laughs) And what is a mantle? Precisely. God's given you the mantle of Charles Finney. Then I found out Finney was an attorney and I tried to read his systematic theology for years and finally gave up and said, it's worthless. I can't help it. (laughs) My public school, my Marion County public school education is is flaring up. (laughs) And then in my 20s, I started getting to travel and preach. And then God broke me. He takes you. He blesses you. He breaks you. He never goes outside of his own home. He doesn't bless you, then take you, then give you, then break you. He takes you. Then he blesses you. Then he breaks you so that he can give you. So if you're in the taking, wonderful. Because the blessing's next. If you're in the blessing... (laughs) 
I'm going to pray for you. <laughs> Cause the breaking's next. But he only breaks you so that he can give you. That's why you should never trust somebody that's not been tested. I told our students this this past week. You don't learn what you need to know about ministry by going to Bible school. I've been in ministry since I was 14. I still don't know anything about ministry. Other than people can be crazy. That's all I got. That God's good in people. Hmm. You don't. Real ministry is not you reciting a bunch of Bible facts. Real ministry comes out of the overflow of the process that God's taken you through. Where you can turn back around and say, this is how I survived. Real ministry is nothing but testimony. Real ministry is nothing but testimony. This is how I came through the fire, and this is how you can come through the fire. How do you prepare sermons? Life prepares sermons for you if you will pay attention. What's your sermon process? Survive. <laughs> That's how I go about it. How do you prepare messages? What points do you have? Well, my points are normally things I almost did that would have been really bad that you shouldn't do. He takes you. He blesses you. And he breaks you. But if he doesn't break you, he can't multiply you. It is in the breaking that the multiplication happens. Y'all see, y'all see like y'all see the ramp now. Y'all, y'all see, y'all see the RSM campus now. Let some original first years testify. We used to have class in the kitchen. Like that kitchen. Like I had to stand in the kitchen. People see this, all of this, but they miss, they miss the, the Karen Wheaton that was on buses carrying babies all over the country. That sounds sexy. It's not. That sounds like a lot of fun. It's not. You only do that because you're called to do it. You only do that because there's a vision growing on the inside of you that you can't even give all the language to yet, and you've got to obey God to do it. Ministry isn't. What, what? I, 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 went to a, I went to a church growth planting, whatever they call it. I don't know all the terminology. It's where you go to learn how to plant a church. And we were there. We were there for several days, and we learned all of this stuff. All of it. Money and finance and staff and facilities and buildings and all this stuff. My phone's dead, by the way. If I'm going long, it's because my timer died. So. And we're getting there, and we're, we're at the very end, and now I, we're sitting with probably 50 couples. Lindsay, Lindsay, me and Lindsay were there together. Probably sitting with 50 couples, and we're, we're the last session we're doing a QA and a with a very famous pastor, very famous pastor. And we're all getting ready to plant churches in the next four to six weeks. And we're going to do this Q&A session. This is the first Q&A session that I've ever seen this happen, especially with ministers. But there's a Q&A session. And the first question that gets asked is a young pastor is about to plant his church. This is what he wants to know. So, pastor, talking to the, to the, to the man, how do you go about preparing sermons? Because I've never really done that. And I'm like, you're about to be preaching every week for the rest of your life in about a month. And you thought all of this stuff, money and marketing and mailers and social media, you thought that was ministry. That has nothing to do with it. He takes you. Then he blesses you. But then he has to break you. Because if he doesn't break you, he can't give you at the level he wants to give you. He can feed you as a loaf. Or he can break you into crumbs and spread you across nations. But in the breaking is the multiplying. 
I grew up in a Christian teaching that said God doesn't want you to suffer. You know what changed my mind on that? Life. Not theology, not some scriptures, not some debates. Life. So above all, trust in the slow work of God. Because he's always working. And sometimes he's working in ways you like. And sometimes he is not. And then I learned God treats us like an old typewriter. Y'all don't know what that is. You can Google it when you get to the <laughs> dorm room. You know what old typewriter is? You just type. Na -na 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 -na. Ding. Then you go. Mm, ding. Boom. And I've learned that's what God does. He takes us. And then he blesses us. And then he breaks us. And then he gives us. And while we're celebrating the giving. And while we're telling everybody about how we survived. You know what God's doing? Boom. And then he's going to take us again. And then he's going to bless us again. And then he's going to break us again. And then he's going to give us again. And while we're writing our books about how God broke us and gave us and did all this stuff and preaching our sermons, you know what God's going to do? He's going to take us again. And then he's going to bless us greater so he can break us deeper so that he can give us greater. They knew him in the way that he broke the bread. Stand on your feet. They knew him in the way he broke the bread. There is something profound about the fact that we call breaking bread communion. Because that's when you discover who God is. And they knew him and how he broke the bread. You will know God in ways. You'll learn things about God that you will never, never learn. Listening to the greatest sermons, singing the greatest songs, downloading the most fire podcast. You will learn things about God you will learn no other way. Until he breaks you. And they knew him in the way he broke the bread. You pray one way when you're in blessing, you pray a different way when you're in breaking. That's why Paul said, You don't know how to pray as you ought. You don't know what to say. When your whole world's turned upside down, sometimes simply walking into a room and laying down and not saying a word, sometimes your very presence is prayer enough. Sometimes presence, sometimes being there is all the prayer you got. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, be sure to take good notes because you'll need it. Sometimes your heart is so overwhelmed. Sometimes you're so overwhelmed that there's nothing to say. It's what Paul called groans. Too deep for words. I'm not smart enough to articulate how I feel. I don't have enough vocabulary to encapsulate whatever it is that I need to say to get it out. That's what I'm talking about. That's why I'm so thankful. That's why I'm so thankful for books like the Psalms. Because I'm like, yep, I'm not the only one. That's good news. him in the way he broke the bread. Lift your hands to him. Father, in every season, we trust you. In the taking, we trust you. 
in the blessing. We trust you. In the breaking. We trust you. Bring that down just a little bit if you want. In the giving, we trust you. There's an old, I think it's Hill Song. Old Hill Song song. It says, this is my prayer in the desert when all that's within me feels dry. This is my prayer in my hunger and in my need. My God is the God who will provide. Pastor Jacob, you can come on up. If you need prayer tonight for anything, I don't know how you want to close this. If you need prayer tonight for anything, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And there, again, there are people in here, you don't know, you don't have any idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> You're like, man, he's been through some stuff. No. <laughs> You're leaving me like, is Pastor Casey okay? Anybody need to check on him? <laughs> and then there's people in here, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm speaking your language. No matter where you are. That's the good news about all this. I came to encourage you and give you hope in some weird, twisted kind of way. To say that everybody in here is in the process somewhere. Everybody in here is in the process. We bless you in Jesus.